Hello and welcome to the CSF Rheumatology Author Interview Podcast. My name is Professor Peter Nash from the Griffith University of Brisbane and today I'm, we're very fortunate to be joined by Professor Vivica Strand from Stanford University in California. Welcome Vivica and thank you so much for your time. Thank you Peter. Look, can you, just to start with, can you tell the audience who I'm sure everyone knows you very well, but a little bit about yourself, how you got into rheumatology and how you got to Stanford and how you got involved with clinical trials and research? I'm not even sure I remember how I got into rheumatology. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't that I long think ago? It, I, think, I think it was immunology. It was so much fun. And let me see. Well, I did my fellowship at UCSF, and then I, uh, my grants went to Texas, and I wasn't leaving California, so I yeah. actually went into practice in San Francisco for six years and did a rheumatology subspecialty practice, and it was during the early days of HIV, really <laughs> a very tragic time, lost a lot of patients and friends and, and colleagues. I ultimately went to work on an AIDS therapy, Gansiclovir, for CMV infections, and subsequently two other biotech companies for a total of six years. And after that is when I started my consulting practice for clinical development and regulatory strategy in rheumatology. In the meantime, I'd been on clinical faculty at UCSF, and at, in 93, I was invited to Stanford, and I've been at Stanford ever since. So I do both consulting and I see patients with the fellows and teach, lecture and so on. Excellent. And how is the COVID situation currently? A lot of telehealth and has it affected your practice a lot? Yes, it has. A lot of telehealth. And, but that's actually working out fairly well. Um, we still have patients that are being seen. Uh, what's sort of interesting is that, you know, we're familiar with the use of these biologic agents which are being tried in COVID, but by and large, it's not the rheumatologists who have the expertise who are involved in using them, which is an interesting perspective. It is, isn't it? So yeah. look, today we're talking about a recently published article, I think it was the July edition of Arthritis and Rheumatology, which dis discusses the efficacy and safety of upadacitinib monotherapy and methotrexate naive patients with moderate to severe RA. So just two questions. Can you let the audience know a little bit about UPA itself and let us just a feeling for how UPA is going since its launch in the US, given that TOFA has been around a long time, Barry's limited to two milligrams in your country. How's it gone? Well, it's interesting. It's going quite well. So I think upadacitinib is getting the kind of uptake that um, is benefited from the experience with TOFA. I think people are seeing that if you've lost a response to TOFA, you may well gain it with upadacitinib. I don't think there's as much, uh, shall we say, excitement around baricitinib, but when you really look at the berry data, the data between two and four milligrams is not very different. And it's not really clear that you're going to get more benefit from the four than the two. I think we still think that TOFA at the higher dose could be better, but I don't think we see it in terms of berry. And I'm not sure we see it with UPA either, since, of course, it's only approved at 15. But it's in the trials, it's actually been almost as effective or even a little bit more effective than the 30 milligram dose. So the real difference has been the adverse events. Okay, so let's um, talk a little bit about this study. Can you just tell us a bit about the aim behind why this study was done? Because well, this in many study countries was, in the world, we're not allowed to go MTX naive with any advanced well, therapy. We're, we're not either. We have the same <laughs> labeling. But you never want to make the mistake of not having studied an early population. If you go back to Abitacid, we didn't learn what it looked like in a naive population until several years after it was approved. And that really never changed anybody's perception of how much better it works in early disease. So all of the, all of the JAK inhibitors have been studied in methotrexate naive patients. And I think that's an important point. And I also think that over time, we're gonna to migrate to using the JAK inhibitors before methotrexate and the flunamide because I think they're better tolerated and they certainly work faster. Yeah, I think we'll come to that towards the end, but 
can you tell us a little bit about um, how the study was put together, the methods that you used? Well, basically, th this was to look at <clears throat> about 300 patients uh, per treatment group, um, actually 314 to 317. And this was an early disease population. So they may have had up to two, 2.6 to three years of disease, but by and large, the median disease duration was half a year. So this was a population that was mostly not in the United States, um, but the kind of population we would hope would show the nice responses in early disease. As with most of the other populations, about 76% female, and very few had had as long as even three weeks of methotrexate. So we know they were really methotrexate naive, and about about 45 to 50% were using glucocorticoids. So very typical of most of these early disease populations we see in trials. Okay, and the three arms? Methotrexate, which was almost 20 milligrams in that group, versus upadacitinib 50 daily, versus upadacitinib 30 daily. I'm, I've always laughed, and it's done routinely, how they, <clears throat> crippled methotrexate by saying you can get to 20, but you got two months to get there. And exactly. then at week, at week 24, they take their primary endpoint. So um, <clears throat> we get to sort of 20 milligrams in two weeks, not two months. So what, no, we certainly don't. Yeah, it was, a very <laughs> slow, it was a very slow increase. And I'm not sure why they did it quite so, quite so conservatively, but I think that probably had to do with some of the other uh, populations. And practices. Japanese. Yeah. Well, I think it's routine now in clinical trials, but anyway. So what were the uh, main results of the study? The study was positive for sure. It made all of its primary endpoints. And what's important as well is that the difference between 15 and 30 of upadacitinib was very small. So at 24 weeks, uh, the CR50 was 66 versus 60 versus 33 placebo. And the DAS-28, uh, less than 2.6, was 50, 48, and 19. So those are nice primary endpoints. Um, if you look at 12 weeks, you can see that already the ACR-50 was reached in 56 and 52% versus 28%. Essentially, all the other numbers are very nice. The patient reported outcomes are good, the HAC, et cetera. Um, again, very rapid onset of benefit within one to two weeks, and uh, almost always maximum benefit by 12 weeks, even though they made the primary 24 weeks, as it was an active comparator study. And interestingly, the EMEA wanted DAS 28 as their primary out point, uh, primary endpoint, and they hit all those targets as well. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of standard nowadays, EMAA wants or EMA wants uh, DAS-28 uh, remission and FDA wants ACR. And sometimes they're done it at different time points because of that. Uh, but by and large, we see that these endpoints are met. They were actually met by all of the JAK inhibitors that have done a methotrexate naive study. And do you, that was my next question. Uh, the early Barry study, the early TOFA study, are we in the same ballpark of response or does UPA give a slightly higher response compared to those others? I think UPA is giving a slightly higher response. Their That's placebo the responses are a little bit more limited. And overall, uh, as like in the COMPARE study where UPA is actually statistically superior to adalimumab plus methotrexate, um, I think with both doses, I think it's, it, looks a little bit cleaner in all of these studies. I've tried to, um, I, I've tried to track down the supplement to see if I could, if it, they broke down the ACR components because the pain story is fascinating with the jacks. Like in RA Beam, what drove the superiority was patient global, physician global and pain, not swollen right. joints. And right. I just wondered if it was the same in this study, but I couldn't find that uh, ACR components. I, I actually couldn't find it either, although I should have looked it up. Um, <laughs> but seriously, it's true of all of them. When I look at the PROs, patient global, patient pain 
are really driving the responses. I mean, and it, I think it's opens, very important. Yeah, it opens the door for uh, uh, a lot of other pain conditions, diabetic peripheral neuropathy, you know, all kinds of reflex sympathetic dystrophy, a variety of other things that, you know, these drugs might be helpful in. Um, CDI to account for the IL-6 effect on ESR and CRP still had very yeah. nice responses. Yes, it did. Um, facet fatigue showed very rapid responses, and we're seeing okay. that with the JAKs as well. And so that's a nice point. Well, it's interesting because they always tell me these drugs don't cross the blood-brain barrier. So it must be a peripheral nerve effect that they're having or some kind of, you control inflammation adequately, you improve fatigue. The PROs are very popular. Do you think we should be focusing increasingly on the PROs? Because the clinician expects if you control the inflammation, then the PROs automatically improve. Well, I think the reason to follow the PROs is because they show such rapid improvement before the ACR or DAS scores. And the other thing is it may not cross the blood-brain barrier, but we're getting that heavy-duty CRP effect, IL-6 effect, and that does translate into a central effect. Oh, okay. Um, so tell us a little bit about the X-ray, the imaging. The X-ray was statistically significant for both doses of OPA. Very nicely so. Most of these patients were rheumatoid factor, CCP positive. Right. So that's a good point. So that's nice. You, you can't accuse it of being an expensive anti-inflammatory then. It's a disease modifying drug, even no. when, <laughs> even if it's, it's not particularly sensitive. And what and about when the safety? the patients know they're getting better at two weeks, they're much more adherent to drug. So right. I think that's an important point. Right. Tell us a bit about the safety then. How how in your practice do you manage the whole Zoster vaccination issue with all the JAKs? Um, we use uh, the Shingrix vaccine, which can and, be given uh, while people are taking medication. Yeah, Zostavax is no longer available in the U.S. as of okay. July of this year. And you <laughs> give Shingrix to everybody or do you have an age cutoff? We try to give it to everybody. Okay. We end up with some age cutoff with the insurance companies, but okay. we end up trying to give it to everyone. And is it expensive over there? Not too bad. Okay. So tell us a bit about safety then. What were the so everyone wants to know about VTE, of course, but what about yeah. safety issues? Well, so Upatacitinib 30 has has a lesser good safety profile than 15. In terms of the VTEs, those showed up in phase two more than they did in phase three. And in this particular study, there was actually only one in the 30 milligram dose and one in the methotrexate dose and none of the 15 milligram dose. So again, probably too small a population to really give us a signal. Okay. What do we think about VTEs? I think it's a comorbidity of RA. And I think the most frequent are patients who've already had one, <coughs> who have a recurrence. And so then we think about anticoagulation. Otherwise, we think about serious infections. And again, there were more serious infections with the UPA 38 than with the 15, which were five, or methotrexate four. Each of the UPA doses had one opportunistic infection. And the herpes zoster was similar, seven in both doses versus uh, only one with methotrexate. So there's again the signal that we see with the JAKs. If we see LFT elevations, we see CPK elevations, but we know that's an effect on actually myoblast differentiation, again, being started. Um, there, was, there were two GI perforations in the high dose. Uh, the malignancies were small, the maces were small, one, one, and two. Right. Overall, it was a pretty good safety profile. Interesting that when you push the dose to 30, you started seeing a touch of anemia, suggesting you start to lose selectivity over as you push the dose. Yes. I think so, that's uh, true. You also see uh, you also see more effect um, in the context of lymphocytes. Right, and the lymphopenia is pretty rare, which is quite different to some of the others. For example, TOFA. Right. right. And that. 
so the final thing I was going to ask you about the VTE, do you believe it's a JAK2 effect or a pan-JAK effect or a disease activity effect? I'm more prone to say it's a disease activity effect because we've seen it across all the JAKs. It's hard for me to think there's a JAK2 effect because the only, the only real JAK we see effects on platelet counts are berry. Mm. And so I really, I don't have a good explanation for why we would see this type of, of a problem. Okay. And I do think the anemia with upadacitinib does occur. I've had several occasions with that. And it's, it's quite unexpected because you're not looking for it. Okay, and lipids, we should, uh, we're very aggressive with statins these days, but we should keep an eye on lipids. Yeah, except that most of it's because of increase in cholesterol efflux. And, uh, uh, and that's actually a good sign, meaning that the lipid particles are being mobilized. So yes, you may want to use a statin, but it's not clear that you need to use a statin given the effect on the lipids. Okay. And uh, take home message for the clinician. And can you see the day, perhaps with generic TOFA in the not too distant future, where we might jack before methotrexate? I would hope that we would do that before <laughs> methotrexate once we have generic, unless we suddenly have a huge change in our healthcare system, which <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, I'm not so optimistic about. But I definitely think that these are the better oral agents. I think they're better tolerated. I know the dermatologists are very worried about the VTEs, but I think we know how to manage them because we've seen them a lot in our patients. And we know who to be concerned about. And do you think we should start combo and lose the MTX over time? Because in many of the other studies, the combo is slightly superior to the mono. Yes, but I, know, I don't know that it's all that much better. Um, we've seen where you, where you switch and maybe it's a little bit loss of effect briefly, but overall you get to the same place. I'm not sure that methotrexate is such, so well tolerated as to require a combo. Okay. Um, do you think somebody should do a JAK IR study? Do you think yes. we need evidence yes. going from JAK to JAK? I do think we need it. There was one abstract at ULAR and everybody pounced on it out of interest because certainly it looked like everybody who might have lost response to one would respond to another. And I think they're sufficiently different <clears throat> um, structurally that this should occur, but we don't have really good data to prove it yet. Yeah, that's true. Those numbers are pretty small. and They are. Uh, I, yeah. So, um, take home message for this particular study, anything for the clinician? Well, I think the take home method message is this is going to be, say, the best responses you see with this agent, and these are very good responses. And they're, they're good in the context of the degree of placebo response. So, again, I think that uh, in this type of a population, we see what we like to see, which is a better response in earlier disease and a very early onset of benefit. Yes, it was nice to be able to say to a patient, we'll put a quarter to a half of you in remission and 90% no progression. That's, that's not a bad uh, upside. Um, do we need more jacks? Do we need four, five, six, seven, eight? And this Fulgo decision by the FDA, I want your comment on that, given the EMEA gave it the tick of approval. Yeah, well, the FDA is more conservative. <laughs> um, I, I think that uh, what the unfortunate part of it was that the, the studies of the essentially spermatogenesis in the males with IBD or RA are not completed. And the FDA wants to see complete reversibility before they know how they want to label the product. Um, but the issue is how do, you, how do you track male fertility? Because there's that all important female in the middle of it. And so <laughs> there's really no way to say what could or could not be an effect on a male patient. What I'm hearing is that the sperm count in normals is so variable from high to medium to very low that 
I'm afraid they're going to be inconclusive with those two studies. There will be no well, further advance. I, I'm afraid of that too. And I want to also say that in my, my years of being a consultant, beagle dogs often have some problems with spermatogenesis. There are quite a few products that have had some issues. So it's unfortunate that the entire thing happened and it's unfortunate that the data aren't finished. And I think that part of the issue also is to really try to generalize from beagle dogs to man is very hard. Sperm counts are so variable and there's so many things in our environment that are already adversely affecting spermatogenesis that mm. it's very difficult to know what the results might actually mean. Do you buy the selectivity story? Do you think Jack one selectivity is an important thing? And how many more Jacks do we need? Well, I buy the fact that almost all of them have a predominant Jack one effect. Uh, and, you know, the issue really is we don't know where they're working at any given time and what type of cell and for how long. And so when you look at them clinically, they look more similar than they look different. So yes. I'm not sure I do buy the selectivity part of it except that the short half-life is good both for safety and in terms of efficacy. So that part I like. And more jacks in the pipeline? Tick two inhibitors? Yes. And jack Combo three inhibitors? Jacks. Combo jacks. Jack and tick, jack and BTK, jack and, and tech, more jacks, yes. Well, we're just, we're just doing an AbbVie study of a BTK plus UPA in the same tablet. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I hope uh, that's safe, is what I hope. Well, thank you so much for your time, Vivica. It's lovely to talk to you again. Um, this has been the CSF Author Interview Podcast. If you'd like to know more about this paper and others uploaded to the CSF website this month, you can get detailed slide sets are available in the publication section. Go to cytokinesignaling.com. Please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts from and give us some feedback and let us know what you think. Thank you so much, Vivica, for your time. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Good to talk with you. All the best.